Next coming, I'm going to talk about diversity and inclusion. And first question is, do you know what I mean when I say diversity and inclusion? Some, right. Some do, some don't. Okay. Yeah. So, and other question, have, who has had any diversity or inclusion training? Right. I'm seeing like half a dozen hands, about 10, 20% of the room. Okay. So, I looked up, here's a pic, yeah. So, looked up diversity and inclusion in a dictionary. Diversity is the condition of or having been composed of different elements. And inclusion refers to the act or practice of including and accommodating people who have historically been excluded. That's all it is. Um, most of this stuff I'm actually going to probably focus on GCC because that's the project I'm most closely involved with. Um, GDBC, bin utils, GDB. You might want to do your own thing here rather than have a pan sort of tool chain outcome of this. Um, so, uh, this is a boff. Sarah convinced me that would be better, but I'm obviously giving some background here because, as we have established, not many of you have had any sort of experience in what it means to be diverse and how to, what sort of obstacles there are. So, here's a picture of a monochrome, cytumly abstract that's actually in Mass Mocha in Western Massachusetts. If you get a chance, go see that museum. It's interesting. Um, question. Are there enough GNU toolchain developers? Right. For all the things that we would like to happen with the GNU tool chain. No. Right. So, no. That's all that, yeah? Yeah, so you're, you're asking, are there enough developers yeah. to do all the great and wonderful things that we want to do? Yes. And I think the answer is no, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we all want more reviewers, yeah. at the very least. We've had that conversation <laughs> many times. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the other hand, there is. Uh, so, the, not that much, but the good end of that is we do have an opportunity to know pretty much every one of them, which is on the other side a good thing. Uh, and it's easier to reach to people uh, within a smaller community. So, not enough people to do all the work, but uh, it's easier to know and approach people this way. I'm sorry, I can't quite catch what you're saying. That, because there are not that many people, mm -hmm. um, it's easier to figure out who is who, who oh, is working right. on oh, okay. and have you know, a mental idea of uh, yeah. other people in, involved in the community and who, yeah, okay. who is making this community. Yeah. So small, smaller communities, it's easier to know who's who. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I was leading up to is, you know, how can we... Oh, yeah. Conversely, that means that it can be harder for somebody to enter that because it looks more like a small club. And it's certainly true that it's easier for people who are regulars to get a quick review on the list and much harder for somebody who's posting for the first time. Yes, there's a problem with becoming a clique and having no way in, yes. Anyway, what I was trying to lead up to is how can we find more developers? And, you know, um, uh, we've probably tapped out the supply of white men in terms of finding developers. Um, if you look at the human population, you'll notice that the average number of ovaries per human is about one. The average number of ovaries in this room per person is significantly less than that. Now, I'm using the ovaries specifically there because apparently if you use testicles, a lot of male people say, oh, that's fine, and then completely lose their minds when you flip to ovaries. Jeremy. Jeremy. 
So I think you asked the question how we increase. And what I would point out is almost everyone in this room is professionally paid to work on GNU. And that says that the first place you need to look at is hiring strategies from the companies who employ us. How do we get more diversity? Um, how do we increase diversity in the hiring of people? So are you saying increase the diversity in the companies you work in or from the pool of non-diverse people in the company, in probably? Uh, well, all of those probably. But, uh, yeah. Basically, if most people mm -hmm. who work on GNU are doing it because they're, they're, they've managed to get a job in that, yes. you need to have you know, more people of every group that you want to get into. They have to be hired. Yeah. I struggle to hire women because I get 20 male applicants for every one female applicant I get. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to me to say I want a 50-50 recruitment when I'm getting a 20 right. to 1 ratio of resume. What do I do to get 20 more okay. resumes, for example? Where are you advertising and how are you advertising? Uh, on our website and I use a specialist recruiter. Does the specialist recruiter specifically know where to look? Uh, I think there's a distinction maybe to be made between um, the people here who in do indeed are uh, sent by their companies, but there's um, how to get started with contributing to the GNU tool chain, and that's not necessarily um, restricted by that way. So yeah. any, any student we, we should be attracting, whether male, female, anything in between, diverse. Yeah. Um, so it, it's right, the, 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 the companies are the one sending the people here, but uh, before you get to the stage that a uh, company sends you here, there's, there's um, work to be done. I think it's, it's a, there are more complications here. I, I used to work for a couple of companies. You did have both male and female employees. But the problem is that, that uh, well, first the problem is that, that statistically, there are way more males interested in this industry, especially lower you get, more mm -hmm. male, males that are right. interested. I don't know why, it's maybe, I, it's this, this okay. of course. But uh, then, then another, uh, I guess my other problem is that because already the teams are filled out with, with more male-dominated surroundings, uh, the, the female colleagues are a bit, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, say, say uh, uh, they, stay, they tend to shy away from those surroundings because... Okay. Can, can I interrupt you there? Yeah. Because you're falling into a trap that I've actually got some slides for. And could you hold that thought and we come back to it in right, a bit? Right. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, I wanted to get into that trap because uh, I heard my wife. Uh, she also started, uh, entered into the math and computer side of things. And she said that it, during her uh, study time, like when she was deciding where she wanted to go and stuff, she was actively discouraged by professors and teachers and colleagues, uh, other students, because, you know, oh, women tend to like more arts or mm -hmm. biology or whatever. So are you sure you like this? Like uh, second guessing her liking this um, STEM fields because uh, she's a woman, while people who said they liked medical fields or biological or whatever women, we say women are, tend to like more, were never second guessed. So she felt this um, active uh, discouragement. And that's part of the reason we get so little uh, female applications, right. because we're stopping them from studying that. How, can, are, how are they going to apply if they don't have a degree and we stop yeah. them? I feel we're running down a bit of a rat hole of trying to solve a problem without actually describing what the problem is. That's fair. Um, and so if, if I might just stop. So, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm going to bring a different perspective here. Um, for GCC list, um, the only way, at least based on my understanding and my experience over the last year and nine months, is uh, by contributing technically to the team or to the list uh, and the community. I think you sh we should 
increase the scope of the contribution, not just uh, technical contribution. And uh, I think technical is a strong word, not just uh, feature contribution or additions in terms of technical features. Yeah. But if you increase the contribution level to other things, like there are several other things that people can contribute to an upstream community, like documentation or management of the list or any other those any of those other things, if we increase those, um, I think there's a possibility of in attracting more people. So say for uh -huh. instance, I'm but a- Widen our horizon of what we think contributing means. Exactly. Um, yes, okay, yeah. Um, Sorry, just for some numbers, here we go. So and I, I tried to find numbers about the, the, the female. I'm using women as an example because it's glaringly obvious. The same is true for minorities of non-white populations, okay? Um, and, you know, the LLVM conference has an attendance of about 20 to 30% women. So women in the compiler industry or the tool chain industry do exist. And I tried to get, the data I got for the GNU Cauldron was by counting the faces in, in, in the conference photos, so it's not accurate. Um, but of the two that I looked at, there were like about 90 men and two women. So that's significantly different. Um, and, you know, I worked at home before I moved to working at Facebook and actually moved to an office. Um, but that company has like an engineering population of, you know, at least 30% women, with technical developers. And it's like night and day to actually work in an environment that is more like the environment of the society you actually live, live in. Um, and just to be clear, this, colorizing this picture is actually how it is. It's, it's that dramatic difference. Um, and I checked this with um, uh, colorblind filters. So if you, unless you're actually monochromatic vision, you will see a difference in that picture. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, right, yes. So picture of an elephant. It's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, very good. Um, the point I'm making here is, is people that are excluded, people who are not here, are not going to tell you why they're not here. They're just not here. Um, it's up to us to figure, figure this out. And we can't demand that the women who are not here tell us how to encourage them to be here. Um, and actually, there's an incident that you all observed in this conference um, over the days that it's been here. If you recall, and now I want to thank the organizers of the conference for organizing this conference. I'm going to use this example for illustration and take it as the learning example it can be. So when you register for this conference, I was thinking, do you have any dietary needs? People fill that in. The food that was there at lunchtime and at breakfast and at tea was completely unlabeled on the first day. Didn't have any indication of any allergens in it. Didn't have any indication of whether it was vegan or whether it was vegetarian. I'm assuming I, didn't, I know some people filled in that they were vegetarian or vegan. I don't know what the numbers were, but I'm assuming some of them may be in this room. How did that make you feel? And actually, I've discovered, because I thought it, uh, looked it up, we're in the European Union here. Since 2014, all food preparers have to indicate from a list of 14 allergens, allergen groups, whether food is it's in the food. Apparently, the enforcement of that regulation varies across the EU. So as far as I understand, 
it was a legal obligation for those food, that food to be marked. I'm assuming it is now marked, is that correct? I was wondering, well, was this purely a mistake that they failed to do it, or is it intentionally they didn't think it was important and didn't Well, care? I don't know, because it reminded me that actually at previous cauldrons, we've had exactly the same problem. Yeah, the marking, I think, was fixed. Uh, yeah, we got the email and Petra mm -hmm. arranged. Uh, right, uh, yeah, the, the you know, so, so I think... So it was uh, omission, sorry for that. Yeah. It, it, it needs to be something that's noted down in the document that presumably is of how to run a conference. Check this. Uh, there's some comments up there, yeah. But that's purely, you know, I, I'm, I'm really using this as, as an example of how the vegetarians and vegans in this conference felt and the people with food allergies felt about their inclusion. inclusion. So, Nathan, you've, you've hit the right thing, and I think what that emphasises is that we can do our... You know, Sarah had that information up to spot on, and it went through, you know, went through to Petra and um, Honza, but it shows you have to have a whole systems approach to this, because in this case, I think the floor fell out at the university catering mm -hmm. a level, and we have had that issue before. Actually, when we, we have had a couple of cauldrons in the UK, where the person who was doing Sarah's job actually is by profession a, a, a hospital caterer. And you will have noticed in particular the catering at the Cambridge event mm -hmm. really was probably exemplary and ahead, but that was because it was run by someone who this was her professional discipline uh, in organizing. But mm -hmm. it is hard and it requires a whole systems approach. And mm -hmm. because of the way we run this conference mm -hmm. where it is the host organization. We do, yeah. you know, we can give guy, you, you, well, you can lead your elephant to water, but can you mm -hmm. make it drink? Yeah. Um, so I just want to add to this is that the fact that, so obviously we try and have different companies, different places host. And I'm aware that it's very, it's never been kind of formalized. So mm. this year during kind of the admin side, I've been trying to document the fact of these are the processes that we, we go through. And I have, obviously we'd had a private conversation mm. about this. And I have included the fact that on mm. the first day, it's checking that these labels are there. Mm. I'm aware that there are a few people with various allergens and things, and I've been going around manually checking. So from my point of view, I do yeah. apologize that if you haven't been able to eat, um, hopefully mm -hmm. that you have now been able to food. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm trying to, yeah, take this as a way, how can we fix this? We put tests in the test suite to check we've got the compiler right. It sounds like, you know, what Jeremy said, a systems approach and you need to check. And anyway, I don't want to dwell too much on that because I'm just using it as, as, as an example. Yeah, just Thank uh, you for organizing yeah. the conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just for the catering, uh, it was done also by the you know, kind of professional company, which is having the restaurant in the basement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I somehow assumed that they will know what to do. Uh, and if mm -hmm. I think back, I don't think it was ever labeled on any other conference here. So right. I think that's something we should fix, uh, you know, mm -hmm. building-wise at least. Yeah. Um, okay. So there is another inclusion issue that is very dear to me, oh, yes. which is that of free software compatibility. I, I see here we're using Zoom. I know right. people who okay. would like to, to be I'm going to stop you right there. That is completely irrelevant to this talk, and you're hijacking it for what you want to engage in, polit in, in, in that kind of po technical oh, politics. That's and your really approach to inclusion? You, 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 you just say, oh, we don't care about people who care about software freedom, but which is the reason we are here? I, I completely disagree with that approach to inclusion. Inclusion is about including, not okay. picking okay. which I'm, ones you I'm want so, to exclude, so, so, which ones are fine yeah, to ex exclude. Yeah. I know people who would like to participate in this okay. afternoon sessions and who cannot okay. because they are committed to not using okay. non-free software. Right. This well, is a very serious inclusion issue for okay. this conference. I, I, would, okay. I would like, if possible, to, to, to be able to tell the, these people how to participate in this afternoon. So, 
I'm actually sympathetic. It is inclusive, and we have this with the British Computer Society Open Source Specialist Group. There are people who won't, and Zoom is worse than that because there are some corporates that won't let you lose it anyway. But we were stuck between a rock and a hard place. This should have been Big Blue Button, but the ability to use Big Blue Button failed at the last minute, and the only option we had was to use the university system, which happens to be a Zoom system. And sometimes in the real world, stuff happens, and you have to compromise and do the best you can. We learn from it, we go away and say, but, you know, um, you know Linux plumbers have Big Blue Button set up, but it's a nightmare for them, and we don't have the budget to set up Big Blue Button okay. from scratch. And if we'd known this was a problem longer time ago, and we only found out a couple of weeks ago, then we could have done something about fixing that. But in the real world, things go wrong at the last minute, and we're stuck with what we're stuck with. And I'm sorry people got excluded. That will happen occasionally in all sorts of scenarios. And you can't get it perfect, and you just have to do the best you can. And that's why we've got Zoom here, not because we thought Zoom was a good thing, but because it was the way of getting right. out. The alternative would be to exclude all remote participants and say, haven't got a free solution, sorry, you're not here, you can't take part. Also very discriminatory. All right. Okay. Yeah, so, Alex, sorry, I, I apologize for my outburst there. Uh, may I suggest an IRC group for, for conversation, for participation and this afternoon, along with Zoom? Is that viable? I think you're derailing the talk think by try the discussion by trying to fix a problem that you've identified. And I think, yes, oh, yeah. I think fixing it right now is going to be difficult. Um, um, yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, I know I imagine that for most people, the idea of you know allergens in the food or the um, vegetarian options and vegan options are um, not something that affects you personally. So um, it's we always think, no, yeah, it's good that we have that. Uh, it's a shame that it didn't work and something like that. So uh, from Why seeing my the wrong from seeing my there? wife who um, is yeah. a vegetarian and her reaction when. Uh, we came to Europe, which has a lot more vegetarian options. Uh, I think I can best translate that scenario in a way that everyone can understand to, well, imagine if when you're signing up to the conference, they asked, will you, will you be bringing a laptop to the conference? Uh, will you require power? And then people mark yes. And then they say, yes, there will be uh, outlets in the rooms for you. And there are a couple outlets by the door or they forget to mark the outlets, and some seats have them and some don't. Um, that is, I, I don't say that to uh, attack the people who uh, made the mistake. Uh, I know that it is done in good faith, and I know that uh, you are trying to do your best, and you are doing a great job. I'm just talking to the rest of the people. To give you an example where you can put yourself in their shoes and feel a similar way to how they would feel. That's all that I, I'm trying to do. Um, so whenever we talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, just that's sort of an example, just to put yourself in that place. I don't know how I feel about comparing food or not using IRC right now to the diversity that's actually happening in our society. As a woman, I'm a woman. You know, we saw something happen. We saw the food, we saw the labels. Sure, if we're gonna go that direction. And we did address the problem and we fixed it. Bruno is saying that his wife was hearing from professors that, why are you studying this? I heard the same phrase, basically. Why do you study this? Is this really for you? We are seeing from a young age that women are being discouraged to study computer, to be a developer or whatever. So mm. if, you do t if you take the same approach as we, as we did with the food, okay, we're seeing the problem, let's fix it. How can we fix it? It's not about this conference and it's not about hiring processes because we already, already lost so many women on the way. It shouldn't be the hiring processes and sorry, I don't wanna be hired because I'm a woman. We should encourage women to be at their best, to study, to go somewhere with their education if they want to study computer. 
It's supposed to be happening from a young age. Right. It's not about higher um, I've, I've got a comment, that's a good point there. But here's the thing. I've got a graph and I've got some data um, that what you've described is the leaky pipeline of women being discouraged from STEM from a very young age. Okay, and it's very easy for us here, in the, in, in, you know, sort of at the end of that pipeline to go, the problem's over there, All right? We should fix the bit of the pipeline that we're in control of and fix it because that's what we can do. Okay, yes. So, yeah, <clears throat> sure. And we are working for huge companies. Mm -hmm. We can maybe not control five-year-olds, but we can have talks with schools. I yes. mean, the least you can do as a company, reach out not only to universities, because we're really good at reaching mm -hmm. out to universities, because we want people to work for us. Reach out to younger people. I remember going to, when I went to high school and we were promoting our high school, they sent us to middle school. Talk to middle school people, why they should choose our high school. Yes. So talk to middle school, why they should, everybody should feel encouraged to yes. study computer. So as big companies, yeah, we cannot maybe control what society is saying, mm -hmm. but we can encourage young people by reaching out to the school where young people are oh. actually studying. So we can do something on the whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the excellent point that individually, we could go to schools and give talks. That called us a lot of thing. So I think Jana has taken, the point I was making about recruitment was Jana's taken it to where it should go, mm -hmm. which is why are we not getting the recruits through? How do we get people in? Right. And in particular with Western educational systems, which have this male bias on engineering, it doesn't happen out in, in um, uh, Asia Pacific, it's less so, it's much more equal there. And what, yeah, exactly. And one of, the, one of the, I think this then ties into the conversation we were having yesterday about mm -hmm. training and education. Right. And I got into compilers very early on mm -hmm. because I came across a book about parsing and I right. was astonished that you could take a language and actually structure it from the text back mm -hmm. to the structure of the language. Mm -hmm. And actually that's something that's perfectly okay. accessible at the key time, which is 11 to 13, which is up to 11, right. in the UK certainly, boys, girls, absolutely right. no split between interest and science. Yeah. And it's 11, 13, I saw it with my own daughter. She used to work for me, right. and she's one of the Je best people with a soldering iron out there. She would not, I was sworn to secrecy never to tell her friends that she was not good with a soldering iron, she was right. good with a soldering iron, because right. it would completely ruin her street credibility yeah. as a young girl, yeah. Je and we've Je got to break that. And yeah. that's where Yana's yeah. right, get into the schools. Yes, that's excellent points. However, that's a solution that has been talked about for here we go, here, there's a graph here of data, right? And you will notice it stems task and look, look where computer science is. In 1990, it was up to like 35% and it's dropped down to 20% since then. Whereas other STEM, class, STEM subjects have not. You know, I think you know, programming is maths, why is it not up there at the 50% level? Right, and, and, and teaching, you know, encouraging young uh, children to go into STEM is a solution that, will, that might have, have a result in 15 years, right? I don't want to wait that long. Well, uh, as my colleague Bruno said, uh, I kind of have a similar situation. My wife is also an engineer. We studied together, mm -hmm. actually. And I actually come from Eastern, Eastern Europe, not this okay. Eastern. I'm actually from Serbia, so we are really Eastern Europe. So as, as you can imagine, we are a bit behind, at least while I was studying mm -hmm. then from modern Europe and, and what is being done. But even there, uh, on, uh, on my uh, faculty side, we had like 200 people, 200 mm -hmm. students. And at the time, at least 40% of those were female. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see uh, I, I guarantee you from my perspective, I knew the professor, most of the professor really well. I didn't see any kind of discrimination, just uh, we had three directions that one can choose. Mm -hmm. It's like automatics, mm -hmm. software, low level software, and then high level software. 
most right. of my colleagues, female colleagues, just went right. for high level software. And most of the reasons was the uh, it was it wasn't attractive, kind of almost mm -hmm. like a marketing the lower mm -hmm. level level uh, uh, for them. So maybe we can kind of figure out how to kind of make it more mm -hmm. attractive to people. Not, right. not, not only uh, people that are not really mathematically inclined that much, okay. or uh, also shied away from yeah. that. So. One of the things you've just said there is you didn't see any bias. You're a man. You yeah. do not see the bias that women see. Right, but as I said, my wife started with me. And she also didn't see it. I also had a lot right. of okay. female friends. Okay. They, they also didn't I, see it. Yeah. it was just, Maybe. My point, yeah. my point is that being in a superior position of being a white dude, I just don't see some of the barriers until they are pointed out to me. For instance, you know, I, before I actually moved to the States, I used to travel to the States a lot. I would have pleasant conversations with the immigration officer about what computer they might want to buy. Somebody who looks like me didn't know how long it would take to get through immigration, so I had no idea if they could make their connecting flight or not. I yeah? Yeah, anyway, so Sarah's. So, all, all I was going to do is to bring it back to kind of now and to this community and to this cauldron is the fact of, and I appreciate you probably don't have this. Day, but it would be interesting to see the percentage of women on who contribute to GCC and all the hmm. various projects. I'm not an engineer, so I, I, I don't know. I'm not on any of them. But I would be interested to see the percentage of people who are on the mailing list, who are contributing, who are working on the project, mm -hmm. and then the number at Cauldron. Because I'm aware that the number, the number of women at Cauldron is about, I think there's maybe six in person versus for the 90 odd that are here. So it'd be interesting to see whether this is an issue that women don't feel able to come to Cauldron or women aren't part of the community. And I think they're two slightly different arguments, but two things that definitely need to be worked right. on. Yeah. Um, I contemplated trying to figure that data out from names, but that was just, I figured the error bars would be too stupid on that. Nathan, there's, there's actually, you, the names is really critical. So there's some excellent research, I, cannot, I can never remember names, from a guy who was a professor at Brunel University. And he did name analysis on names of various big projects. And what he was looking to do was to take the names and see which were identified as male, which could be identified as female, and which could not be identified. And what he was actually looking at, and this is purely statistical analysis, was that the more you see the neutral names appearing in the middle, that's more an indication of women who feel they cannot, they want to hide their gender behind a, um, a, a nom de plume. And he's got fairly good statistical information showing the inclusivity of a project is quite well mirrored. So if you take something like Stack Overflow, mm. notoriously not very woman friendly, you find very few explicitly women names, a huge number of nom de plume. If you look at WordPress, which is actually one of the more inclusive projects out there, you find a much more equal balance of women and men. Okay. Now, I suspect we're too small for that to really right. work. As it's a useful analysis. Yeah. Those are actually hard statistical facts of understanding how inclusive are you from looking at names. Yeah, actually, go to Sarah's point. LLVM conferences, 20 to 30 percent women. So they don't, ha that, 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 they don't have data on the mailing list gender um, uh, distribution, but they did have that. But one could actually argue for between LVM and Cauldron here that LVM, at least in my country, is actually studied in most of the universities and, and mm -hmm. they actually bisect it and all of that. Mm -hmm. GCC and Cauldron, not really. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like the new university project everybody's on. Yeah. So that could be the right. actually being studied on the on the and then yeah. everybody's feeling comfortable and joining in. LLV, LLVM yeah. has a huge mind share. But here's the thing that I said earlier: the people that are being excluded will go somewhere else. Well, I have a suspicion I know where they went. So on, just explicitly on the LLVM Foundation. Remember, the LLVM Foundation has four pillars it's based on. One of those is inclusivity. It used to be women in compilers. It's now more explicitly inclusivity in compilers. It is, of course, headed by a woman who's passionate about it, Tanya Lattner, fabulous advocate for women in engineering. And the day before LLVM meeting, 
there is an inclusivity meeting. I'm not sure it's actually happening this year, but it used to be called Women in Compilers. It's now, I think, Community IO. Um, and that is explicitly a meeting dedicated a whole day just to activities and tasks and talks about inclusivity. Right. So it's a very, very proactive. And maybe we should do the same thing and have Community IO on the Thursday before Cauldron. Yeah. Um, actually, you've reminded me of something that I forgot at the beginning, and I want to thank Cindy Ishida from NLBM for reviewing my slides and giving me some feedback. Um, uh, my, my one thing is that, you've obviously, and I totally agree, that people will go elsewhere if, the, if, if it's not. So is this something where we need to get, like, start working with universities? I'm aware that we give free tickets or we support students coming to Cauldron. Is, there, is this something that we should be doing? Should we be trying to reach out to local universities in the various places we are? We're all from around the world. Should we be reaching out to you, our local universities going, have you heard about GCC? Should we be talking with lecturers? Is that a way that we can then, it both brings better diversity within to this community, but also gives students a chance to learn something that may be different to LVM? Um, Nick's got a comment. Um, yeah, so you can Google that phrase, five biases pushing women out of STEM to find a, um, a Harvard Business Review article about five biases. Uh, so, so I'm going to, I'm wearing my devil, devil's advocate hat here for a second. Um, if people who've been excluded from the GCC community are finding the LLVM community as an alternative mm -hmm. and prospering there, mm -hmm. isn't that actually a good thing? Doesn't that, that mean that these, these people right. who have been excluded and have now found inclusion elsewhere yeah. and that what we ought to be doing is getting mm -hmm. rid of the GCC community, yeah. which is obviously toxic and bad, <laughs> and promoting LLVM? Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, Yes, probably true. I'm trying to use LLVM as an example, as an existence proof. Uh, okay. And <laughs> also the the. <laughs> hmm? Can we get through the presentation? It's a bot. Okay, it is a bot. Um, and I, I've, I've got I've got a couple of slides I'd really like to get to. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give a quick answer to Nick. You forgot the first question. Do we not want more developers here? Only if we're an inclusive community. If we're a toxic hmm. community. Okay, fair. Yeah, I was going to, so Jeremy made an excellent point that I actually had on, on a slide that I think I skipped up. You know, LVM has an inclusivity statement. We don't, maybe, maybe on the wiki or somewhere there should be. Uh, what? Well, no, here's the thing. If you're going to object to everything we want to do because you can't see the change that is going to make, we're never going to make any changes. One of the things about an explicit statement saying what you stand for is that people understand what you stand for. And now I'm going to get on to a, another bit, um, which I think is probably more significant. Okay. Now, having an inclusivity statement up there in the mission statement of the project gives a clear indication that people will be listened to and there isn't going to be a small clique as um, we talked about earlier on with um, you know of a small project that's hard to get into okay and it's there for everybody to see it's like putting your money on the table for all to see that this is what you're committing to. And then people can hold you to that. Okay, so I've got, you know, one of the things about, you know, the five, the five uh, biases, you know. Women in technical industries tend to have to be prove that they're competent, even though like they've got a degree and everything, and then they do a thing, okay, that's great, and then they have to do it again and again to keep showing that they're actually competent. Um, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Oh, right, another one is isolation. It's like, if you're only woman on the team, or the, you know, the only black person on the team or whatever, you know, well, we won't invite them to this event because they won't like it, they're the only woman here. It's like, well, A, maybe they would like it, and B, why are you organising events that, are going to, that they're not going to like? Okay. 
That's the kind of biases that happen, and people tend to not notice that unless they're the affected person. Um, right, did I have some? Right, yes. So actually, I wanted to skip that one and come back to this one. Here we go. So this is the slide about um, uh, yeah, codes of conduct. There's a code of conduct for this conference. Why is there not a code of conduct for the project as a whole? Okay. The point of a code of conduct is to clarify your, your mission and the values linking your technical stuff to, your, to the community that you're part of. We talk about this as a, as a tool chain community or the GNU community. Community means people. Yeah. And it indicates to people that can face, you know, face barriers. Like Jeremy said, a lot of women want to not be overt about their gender on the internet because trolls. It's meaning that those, they, they can see the mission, the, the code of conduct, and know they won't have to deal with bullshit. Um, and as an example, uh, an example earlier, you know, 18 months ago, I went away and I was on the LLVM Discord channel. And somebody there was kind of trolling me and I couldn't quite work it out. And I thought, well, am I being overly sensitive? Whatever, you know, I'll go. And I didn't like interacting on that channel, but I left it over the weekend. The, on the, the next week, they had been banned because they, and I didn't actually have to report this, but I was thinking about it, okay? Um, and it was like, oh, right, yeah, good, great. Because they hadn't just been harassing me, they'd been harassing other people as well, apparently. The person who banned them, the name that a lot of you will recognize, Eric Christopher. You know, and that made me feel much more welcome in that community because an annoyance had been taken away without me actually having to do anything. But if I needed to do something, I, know, I knew who to tell because it was clear, this is how you report a problem. Uh, Nathan? Yes? I, I, I would like to <laughs> interject for a moment. Um, I've seen codes of conduct being used more for exclusion than for okay. inclusion. I'm I, I, very concerned about yes. The, the, I understand I, your. I, I understand your guidelines. Yes, I understand and, and, your concern so, there. I've got some more data about that, if, awesome. if, I, if I may. Thank you. Um, um, now, I couldn't find data about the distribution of projects that have codes of conduct and the distribution of projects that don't. What I did find that, that it seems like most new projects have codes of conduct. It's like one of the tick list features you do for setting up a project. Um, and most complaints about codes of conduct come from people who are not part of that community. Um, It, 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 it's people who fear they will fall. It seems, to, I think the, the, the subtext there is people who fear they will fall foul of the code of conduct or that the code of conduct would be used as a, a, a weapon of exclusion, right? However, I think the subtext there is they're jerks. Now, so I looked up about what good code of conduct have and don't have, okay? Um, and primary thing about code of conduct is it's not a punishment mechanism. It's a mechanism for uh, addressing issues. So think about, you know, aircraft incident investigators. They want to find out what happened, what led up to what happened, and how to fix it so it doesn't happen again. And you, if you read aircraft accident reports, you generally don't find out about what any disciplinary action or whatever happened to the pilots, if it's a non-fatal accident, because that's irrelevant. Generally, these things are systems failures. 
Um, so, you know, you want to, the code of conduct should clearly say what its purpose is. You know, have an inclusive and productive environment. And it should have examples of the kind of behavior you want to encourage and examples of behavior and descriptions of, of what to avoid. And it's clear that these are not prescript, you know, the line between legal and illegal in the general law is a little wiggly line, and that's when we have courts of law. This is kind of similar. You can't actually program this way rigor ri rigorously. So as programmers, you have to remember, there are fuzzy boundaries. That's awkward, but it's part of life. Um, there has to be an enforcement mechanism. It has to have teeth. It has to have a clear way of actually reporting issues, not make the person who's being harassed or whatever, or feeling they're being harassed, have to go hunting around some wiki or, or whatever to find, find the email address in the bottom of the basement hidden behind a sign saying, beware of the leopard. Um, talk about scope. Should it just be, you know, online community, the online stuff, or the offline spaces, or only interactions with um, within the mailing lists of the of 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 the project? Um, um, have transparency. It should be transparent. So that the transparency addresses the concern that Alex had about it being a uh, a censorship mechanism. Um, you know, you should issue report, you should report on incidents that happen should be reported on publicly so that you know, so everybody can see what actually happened and, uh, and what was done about it. And from there they can make a judgment call about whether they think censorship's happening. Um, going back to LOVM, LOVM added a code of conduct you had to accept it to participate in the mailing list and stuff. Um, I understand one person left the project because of that. I don't know about any more than that. Um, in the last year or so, they've had about uh, half a dozen cases to report on. Okay, that kind of level. I don't can't remember how many people are on the mailing lists or in the. In, in the project or the discourse channels or whatever. Um, probably more than this, I don't know. Anyway, so it's that kind of level of um, activity. Um, I guess some people might try and game the system or say, oh, can I, is, is, this, is this acceptable? Is this acceptable? Is this unacceptable? Well, they're jerks. You don't want them in the project. They're trying to game the system. Um, yeah, that's about what I had to say about codes of conduct. And I can see lots of comments. Well, two. I thought Alex had, had, had one, but uh, two. Two is lots. Two is lots. What level of granularity should this be at? Should every individual project have its own separate code of conduct, or should there be one for the GNU tool chain, or right. one for all GNU projects? I think all GNU projects is too big to actually manage. Um, because, you know, I know you guys in, in BIN Utils and GLibC, I, you know, I'm not really very aware of other GNU projects, but I know the core utils, but whatever. Um, and I would, I think it should be probably per project because then per project can manage it and be in control of their own community and the, the, the environment that they want in that community. Um, and that's why, you know, I said, I was talking about GCC. So I would, you know, it would be fine. Yeah, I think, you know, bin utils have, have their own code of conduct. Maybe the same code of conduct, but you probably want to, you know, if you did it that way, have different reporting mechanisms and transparency mechanism. But, uh, just, it, it sounds like it's a bit of an administrative overhead. So yes. Be doing transparency yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. 
every single project has to implement their own hmm. methods of doing Maybe. It. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, there is an overhead. I had a slide for that. Actually, it was the very next slide. Oh, hang on. It wasn't that slide. It was this slide. Hang on. No, yeah. That one. Sometimes you have to do something. So, Nathan, I think what I was going to say, the rules you have, they're great, and the code of conduct we've got here is actually the British Computer Society mm. Open Source Code of Conduct, and I've just been pointed out that the GNU Rust project does have a code of conduct. Okay. Um, but... Above that, you need to set your, if you like, your mission statement, your culture, because mm. it's, the code of conduct is really dealing with the, the, if you like, the end. But if you want to include people, you need a mindset that says, when I review a beginner's comment, I'm going gentle on them. Okay? And that's mm. more than just sticking to the code of conduct. It's, I've got to encourage. How do I use encouraging language? Not code of conduct matter, hmm. that's a culture matter. And the code of conduct, you have gone way off the culture thing to right. becoming unacceptable. Yeah, that, that's, that's, so you need to sit in that context. That's an excellent point. And I, I think as programmers, we tend to, you know, we, we, we can be very blunt about bits of code because we care about bits of code and we don't see that, oh, that language is discouraging. And I, I know. Um, in the C++ standardization, you know, in, in the core working group, which we were having, we upset Gabby quite badly because we were trying to understand what he was trying to say with his module stuff, you know, and he, he misunderstood us in thinking we were trying to eject his work where we were just actually trying to understand it. And we didn't see that until somebody pointed it out and we had, you know. I, was the mic up there? I think somebody had it. Oh, right, sorry. I'm so, uh, as, as I said yeah. in one of the previous meetings, I, I'm a bit new here uh, to the GNU and, and, and contribution, so I'm not sure. Uh, is, is this actually, is the actual problem that you can see in the commission that some, that these values are not appreciated right now? Or is this right. is just to have like a good set of values and, and directions? Right. To include I, the I think largely, and probably near entirely, these are values that we already have. We just don't write them down and they're not visible. And so, um, you know, it's a, what I said earlier, it's putting your money on the table so that excluded groups uh, that, that, face, that often face har har harassment will know they don't have to deal with bullshit. Right, but if that is the case, then it seems to be like a small start to actually get... Oh, yes, it's a small point, start, yeah. but I think it's a necessary yeah, one. I I'm not saying agree, yeah. this is going to solve everything, no. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to run over a bit because we started late and stuff, but, you know... True, true, I agree. Yeah. But I, I was just, just, just yeah. thinking, can we go further now? Is there something we can right. do to go even further now? Because um, well, I would love to go it. further now. I think it's lunchtime. Um, uh, uh, and we, <laughs> we, 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 can, we can do more, um, uh, but probably not right now in this room. Okay. You know? I'm not saying stop now. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> because it seems... Of, it needs to be more and more built, and it needs right. to the last couple of years to build it to the point yeah. that we want to get it, right? And yeah. it's, a, it's a work I, that I, we need to continue yeah. to do. I, th I think there's been a lot of great comments here, and um, what I really wanted to do is make people who have not noticed barriers to realize that other people see barriers, or might see barriers, or don't know. Um, oh, one important thing, yeah. Don't go away whilst well, you've looked at this, and make your one black friend speak for all black people. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you.